Chapter 2 Mr. Krepsley was snappish when I woke him. He hated rising before the sun went down, but stopped complaining when I explained why I disturbed his sleep. Mr. Tiny, he sighed, scratching the long scar which ran down the left side of his face. I wonder what he wants. I don't know, I answered. But he said not to leave until you'd had a word with him. I lowered my voice and whispered. We could, we could sneak away if we hurried. Twilight's not far off. You could stand an hour or so of the sunlight if we kept to the shadows, couldn't you? I could, Mr. Krepsley agreed. Were I given to fleeing like a dog with a tail between its legs, but I am not Darren. I will face Desmond Tiny. Bring me my finest cloak. I like to look my best for visitors. That was as close to a joke as the vampire was likely to come. He didn't really have much of a sense of humour. An hour later, with the sun setting, we made our way to Mr. Tall's caravan, where Mr. Tiny was regaling the owner of the Sir de Freak with tales of what he'd seen in a recent earthquake. Ah, Larton, Mr. Tiny boomed. Prompt as ever. Desmond. Mr. Krebsy replied stiffly. Have a seat, Mr. Tiny said. Thank you, but I will stand. Nobody liked sitting when Mr. Tiny was around in case you needed to make a quick getaway. I hear you're casting off for Vampire Mountain, Mr. Tiny said. We live presently, Mr. Krebsy confirmed. This is the first council you've been to in nearly 50 years. You are well informed, Mr. Krebsley grunted. I keep an ear to the ground, Larson. There was a knock at the door and Mr. Tall admitted two of the little people. One walked with a slight limp. He'd been with the Cirque almost as long as me. I called him Lefty, though that was only a nickname. None of the little people had real names. Ready, boys, Mr. Tiny asked. The little people nodded. Excellent, he smiled at Mr. Krebsley. The path to Vampire Mountain is as hazardous as ever, isn't it? It is not easy, Mr. Krebsley agreed, cagily. Dangerous for a young snip of a thing like Master Shan, wouldn't you say? Darren can look after himself, Mr. Krebsley said, and I grinned proudly. I'm sure he can, Mr. Tiny responded, but it's unusual for one so young to make the journey, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Krebsy said curtly. That's why I'm sending along these two as guards. Mr. Tiny waved a hand at the little people. Guards, Mr. Krebsy barked. We do not need any. I have made the trip many times. I can look after that on myself. You can indeed, Mr. Tiny cooed. But a little help never went astray, did it? They would get in the way, Mr. Krebsy growled. I do not want them. My little people, get in the way, Mr. Tiny said it, sounded shocked. They exist only to serve, Larton. They will be like shepherds watching over the two of you while you sleep. Nevertheless, Mr. Krebs insisted, I do not want, this is not an offer, Larton, Mr. Tiny interrupted. Though he spoke softly, the menace in his voice was unmistakable. They're going with you. End of story. They'll hunt for themselves and see to their own sleeping arrangements. All you have to do is make sure you don't lose them in the snowy wastelands on the way. And when we get there, Mr. Krebsley snapped. Do you expect me to take them inside? That is, that is not permitted. The princes will not stand for it. Yes, they will. Mr. Tiny disagreed. Don't forget whose hands the halls of princes was built were built by. Paris Scar and the rest know on which side their blood is buttered. They won't object. Mr. Krebsley was furious, practically shaking with rage. But the anger seeped out of him as he stared into Mr. Tiny's eyes and realised there was no arguing with the little man. In the end, he nodded and averted his gaze, shamed at having to bow to the demands of the interfering man. I knew you'd see it my way, Mr. Tiny beamed, then turned his attention to me. 
You've grown, Darren, he noted. Inside, where it matters, your battles with the Wolfman and Merlo have toughened you. How do you know about that? Mr. Krepsley gasped. It was common knowledge that I'd had a run-in with a fearsome Wolfman, but nobody was meant to know of our fight with Merlo. If the Vampanese ever found out, they'd hunt us down to the ends of the earth and surely kill us. I know all manner of things, Mr. Tiny cackled. This world holds no secrets from me. You've come a long way, Darren. He addressed me again. But there is a long way yet to go. The path ahead isn't easy, and I'm not just talking about the route to Vampire Mountain. You must be strong and keep faith in yourself. Never admit defeat when it seems inevitable. I hadn't expected such a speech, and I listened almost in a daze, numbly wondering why he was sharing such words with me. That is all I have to say, he said, standing and rubbing his heart-shaped watch. Times are ticking. We've all got places to be and deadlines to meet. I'll be on my way. Hibernius, Larden, Darren. He bowed briefly to each of us in turn. We'll meet again, I'm sure. He turned, headed for the door, shared a look with the little people, then let himself out. In the silence which followed, we stared at one another speechlessly, wondering what on earth it had all been about. Mr. Krepsley wasn't happy, but he couldn't postpone leaving. Making it to the council on time was, the mo was more important than anything else, he told me. So, while the little people stood outside his van, I helped him pack. Those clothes will not do, he said, referring to my bright pirate costume, which, had, which still fitted me after all the years of wear and tear. Where are we going? Where we are going, you could stand out like a peacock here, he thrust a bundle at me. I unrolled it to reveal a light grey jumper and trousers along with a woolly cap. How long have you been preparing for this for? I asked. Some time now, he admitted, pulling on clothes of a similar colour to mine in, places of usual, in place of his usual red attire. Couldn't you have told me about it earlier? Yes, he replied in that infuriating way of his. I slipped into the new clothes and looked for socks and shoes. No footwear, he said. Vigar barefoot. Over ice and snow, I yelped. Vampires have harder feet than humans, he said. You will barely feel the cold, especially if they're via walking. What about stones and thorns, I grumbled. They will toughen you up, he grinned, then took off his slippers. It is the same for all vampires. The way to Vampire Mountain is not just a journey, dar. It is a test. Boots, jackets, ropes, such items are not permitted. Sounds crazy to me, I sighed, but took the ropes, spare clothes and boots out of my bag. When we were ready, Mr. Krepsley asked where Madame Octa was. You're not bringing her, are you? I grumbled. I knew who'd have to look after her if she came, and it wouldn't be Mr. Krepsley. There is someone I wish to show her to, he said. Someone who eats spiders, I hope, I sniffed but fetched her from behind the coffin, where I kept her between shows. She shuffled around while I lifted the cage and placed it in my bag, but settled down once she found herself in the dark again. Then it was time to go. I'd said goodbye to Everett earlier. He was taking part in the night's show and had to prepare, and Mr. Krepsley had bid farewell to Mr. Tool. Nobody else would really miss us. Ready? Mr. Krepsley asked. Ready, I sighed. Leaving the safety of the van, we cleared the camp, left the two si let the two silent people fall in place behind us, and set off on what would prove to be a wild, peril-filled adventure into the lands cold and foreign, and lands that were steeped in blood. <laughs>